I think we're uh, class two of six in the Golden Doves. Um, I'm on the page 126, uh, I'm in vacation mode, so you'll excuse my uh, more casual attire. Um, let's go. This is a, a bit difficult, a bit arcane. It's not clear to me exactly what my father, Allah Vashala, meant. But I'll just read the sentences and try to try my best. The notion of an endless movement from one structure to another is superfluous when noting this mirror-like quality of language. So among the post-structuralists, there's a notion of an endless movement in language from one structure to another. But let's try to understand what this endless movement from one structure to another is about. So, um, Jack Derrida, Jack Derrida, he has a concept of uh, deconstruction. And what he tries to do is, he tries to assert that there's an inherent instability in language and texts, contradictions in texts. And he basically challenges the idea that texts have fixed, unchanging meanings. So what happens is that, according to Derrida, what you have is somebody reads a text. And he understands part of it, but he doesn't understand fully. There's some things he doesn't understand. So there's a deferral process. I believe he refers to it as deferance. And I apologize to anybody who speaks French who knows that I'm mispronouncing that word. But anyway, by the word deferance, um, it's what he meant to do is it's the idea of to differ, right? So to something different, but also to defer in the sense of deferring, deferring meaning. So what, um, what Derrida was trying to say is that meaning is always deferred because it's never fully present or complete, or it's always shifting. The meaning of words is always shifting. I mean, this is correct. The meaning of words is always shifting, right? Uh, and as the meaning of words change, the, the meaning of the text changes. That's why we have sort of like an endless desert of uh, uh, always shifting shapes, right? Um, so, so what happens is because the meaning of a word is never fixed, so the meanings of words exist in relationship to each other. There's a difference. You see the difference? So it's a difference between the words. I know that a hammer is not a nail. Those are two different words. So even though perhaps the meaning of a hammer and the meaning of nail change, but those are two different words. So they're different. They differ from each other, right? So meaning is created also by difference. Um, and um, he also says that there is no fixed center in a text, right? And um, there's, there's nothing that can anchor meaning. Right? You say, no, no, like if I'm, if I, let's say, write a, a book on freedom, right? Freedom in America or the First Amendment or freedom of religion, freedom of speech. So there's a central idea that anchors everything. And he, he disagrees with that. Um, so another thing about Daddy Dan, I think this is important just to understand this, um, he argues that meaning always involves an element of absence where what is unsaid itself has a certain um, understanding to it or implies a certain meaning in the sense that it's incomplete and then it needs to be further completed. Um, so let's just read the sentence again. The notion of an endless movement from one, from one structure to another, right? So again, the notion of an endless movement, because as we said, the meaning of words always changes, right? So uh, you let's say you decide, okay, I'm going to give this word a specific meaning. So that changes now the meaning of all the other words, right? That's the endless movement that he's talking about from one structure to another. Um, 
All right. So the notion of an endless moving from one structure to another is superfluous when noting the mirror-like language, the mirror-like quality of language. So what my father says, so for Delilah, there was no meaning. And this is, I think I mentioned it maybe in my previous class, this is why the communists, the Marxists are so infatuated with Derrida, because they use Derrida, because the Marxists were against everything. They basically want to destroy everything, anything good. I mean, if it's bad, they'll keep it. But the Marxists wanted to destroy uh, property. They wanted to destroy capital. They wanted to destroy society. They wanted to destroy family. Um, uh, the Marxists were horrible, and they still are horrible. I mean, it's it's just probably, I, I would say that the communists were possibly worse than the Nazis. It's my own opinion. You don't have to accept it. Um, and I might even change that opinion, but it doesn't matter. For now, I certainly believe that. But the point is, they love Derrida because through Derrida, they can justify there is no meaning, right? There are no permanent structures. There is no fixed center. So for the communist ideology, for the Marxists, seeking to destroy civilization, well, why not? So their male is not really a male, a female is not really a female, the post-Marxists that took over the Democrat Party in America that are seeking to destroy America, these um, wackos base themselves in large part on uh, Jack Derrida and Michel Foucault. So I'm not saying that Jack Derrida had a malicious intent. He may have had a malicious intent. I just don't know enough in order to answer that question. But he certainly is being used maliciously by the um, by the Marxists, and Jordan Peterson discusses that, I believe, as well. Um, gardeners in the background, you may hear that annoying um, buzzing sound. That's a gardener. So, right. So, my, what my father is saying is that this notion of an endless movement from one structure to another. Actually, let me try to give you a, a sense of what it means, a movement from, or an endless movement from one structure um, to another. So let's say you have um, uh, certain freedoms that we have by law, right? right? So law guarantees us certain freedoms. So the freedom is a set of rights and liberties that are granted by the law. Okay, so let's say you have freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom, um, uh, due process of law, right? So here, freedom is a formalized concept structured in terms of legal language. Let's close the window. Okay. okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah. So that's, let's say, that's a legal structure. Then we can move to another structure, let's say a philosophical structure. So here you have the concept of freedom. And because it's a philosophical concept, it can take up a new um, dimension. We can speak about now autonomy, personal autonomy, right? We can speak about ideas such as freedom of will, right? So you see how there's a transformation from, or a shift or an endless movement, right? So the idea of freedom within the system of law to the idea of freedom within the system of philosophy. And then we'll get the existentialist question. And then we can shift to another structure. So let's say to culture. So maybe in culture, freedom can be understood in terms of certain uh, social norms or certain practices, um, right? So I have a right, uh, well, in America, you have a right to cross-dress and you know enter a children's uh, school and present drag uh, to children, right? That's your freedom. And ludicrous and obscene as that is, but that's the idea of the movement. So now the children are not free or the parents are not free to protect their children from the drag, but the drag as part of a cultural norm, of course, have the freedom to prance in front of children. And then you can shift it further. You can say, let's say in economy, so you want free markets, right? You want the freedom to engage in uh, economic activities without undue restriction, right? So you see there's a movement from one structure to another. And what freedom signifies in a particular context, law is not what it signifies necessarily in, um, in culture, 
or in philosophy, right? So, so you see how meaning is deferred across different contexts and across different um, interconnected um, structures. Let's talk about Jorge Luis Borges, or Borges, great Argentinian writer. Um, he often uses uh, labyrinths and mirrors in his works, in his short stories, um, to explore the idea of infinite reflection um, and the interplay between reality and the representation of reality. So, and what we see from Borges' stories is that mirrors or mirrors in Borges' story, they symbolize the idea that reality and mirrors, uh, reality and meaning, I'm sorry, mirrors symbolize the idea that reality and meaning are reflections, often leading to infinite possibilities, right? So there's a story called The Garden of Forking Paths, where mirrors represent endless possibilities and reflections of reality, because you can change the shape of the mirror, the contours of the mirror, the particular, uh, you know, optical qualities of the mirror. So, so there's always going to be slight differences and this this become um, infinite. And then in, in Borges, he tries to blur the lines between reality and fiction, right? Um, so what my father is saying is that because language has this reflective mirror-like quality, this idea of deferring meaning to another structure and then deferring meaning to another structure and deferring meaning to another structure is meaningless because language within itself acting as a mirror with infinite number of types of reflections and self-reflections um, means that there is no need to defer meaning, right? So there's like two, this is... Uh, people often, or some people say that my father somehow agreed with the post-structuralist. And here you see, no, he didn't. I'm just going to read that sentence again. The notion of an endless movement from one structure to another, Jack Derrida, is superfluous when noting this mirror-like quality of language, Faul, Borges. Right? All right, I think we'll, we'll stop here. It was just we just basically did one sentence, but it's like this stuff is really tough. I gotta tell you. <laughs>